Hi, I'm Bernie Flynn. At New Jersey Manufacturers Insurance Company, we believe that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect their daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Building blocks to lifelong learning, next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the PNC Foundation, which supports early childhood education through Grow Up Great, a multi-year initiative to help prepare children from birth to age five for success in school and life. The New Jersey Education Association, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, the heart of academic medicine, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey. Choose New Jersey. Our mission is attracting companies to the Garden State. Cone Resnick, accounting, tax, and advisory, where forward thinking creates results. And by Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech. Promotional support provided by New Jersey Monthly, the magazine of the Garden State, available at newsstands, and Commerce Magazine. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. Far too many children enter school not prepared. Clearly, a strong foundation in early education plays a big role in success later in life. Here to discuss the importance of early childhood education we have on our panel, Stephen Barnett, director of the National Institute for Early Education Research at Rutgers University. Kimberly Baxter McLean, president and CEO, Foundation for Newark's Future. Molly Dunn, executive director of Preschool Advantage. And finally, Cecilia Zalkine, Executive Director of Advocates for Children in New Jersey. Cecilia, you're just telling us, you've been with us many times over the years, this is not your 30th anniversary at this great organization. That's <laughs> it is. I started there while I was still in law school. Well, it is wonderful. By the way, tell folks what that organization is and why it matters so much. Well, Advocates for Children of New Jersey is a state-based child advocacy organization in Newark. And we look at many issues related to child well-being, including early education, specifically preschool. So let's start with you on this one. Um, didn't New Jersey pass a law in 2008? And what did that law say? And why are we still dealing with the fact that uh, that law was supposed to deal with Lots of children who weren't getting the pre-K they needed. Well, in 2008, the New Jersey State Legislature passed the School Funding Reform Act, which had a significant preschool expansion piece built on the, the high quality, really nationally recognized preschool program we have in the 31 low-income districts of the state. It works. It's been successful. It serves all three- and four-year-old children in those districts. And the, the goal of the law was to extend that to about 90 more school districts and another 30,000 more kids. So Why the, hasn't it happened? Hold, hold on. <laughs> New, Jersey has a New Jersey is a national model when it comes to pre-K. Absolutely. And so the legislature said, let's take that model. Let's expand it beyond the 31 so-called Abbott school districts. Those school districts are the ones that... You were part of a court case, a longstanding court case, that involved the lower income school districts, if you will, that said that every one of those children should get a thorough and efficient education as it was stated in the 1947 state constitution. And what has happened? The funding did not come to f provide those 90 or 100 school districts right. money for pre-K. Is that what happened, Steve? That's what happened. Because the legislature said what? It's not important? What? Well, the legislature said uh, we've got a recession, revenues are down, we don't have the money. Is that true? Well, yes, it's true. It's also true that we spent a lot of money on a lot of other things, including the problems we have because we don't send kids to preschool. What kind of problems happen? When you don't send two ki kids to pre-K, and you know this because um, your institute did research a study called the Apple Study, we'll talk about it in a second. What happens to children who do not go to pre-K, most of them? Well, the, a lot of them need special help. They need special education. They fail grades and repeat. They need remedial services. And all those things cost money year after year after year. Later on, do they disproportionately wind up in trouble with the law? Absolutely. And when they disproportionately wind up in trouble with the law, potentially incarcerated, how much more do they cost? Well, if you, you add up all of the additional costs, uh, they're probably an order of magnitude that is about 10 times higher 
than the cost of providing them with good pre-K to prevent those problems. How bad is that uh, policy making? Let's not pay now because we can't afford it, but we're going to wind up paying later anyway. How much sense does that make? Not a whole lot. Why do you think that happens? I think people have short-term priorities and instead of taking a long-term focus. We know that if we invest in pre-K early on, then as Steve said, the investment will be a lot lower down the road. Talk about your organization. My organization is the Foundation for Newark's Future. We're established in 2010 to really try to improve educational outcomes for um, students in, in the city of Newark. We have three priorities, the K-12 system, district, and charter, right. early childhood education, including pre-K, as well as community development. Talk about those kids in Newark. I mean, your organization focuses on Morris, Morris County. Okay. Let's talk about Newark kids. For, for kids who do not qualify, I mean, say every child deserves the right or the opportunity to go to pre-K. What percentage of Newark kids are actually going to pre-K? I don't know the exact percentage, but we know that they're empty slots. They're empty seats, meaning that there are kids in Newark who are eligible for free pre-K seats who are not there. How does that happen? I think there are a variety of reasons for that. There's, you know, lack of information at the parent level. There is lack of coordination at the system level. There is lack of communication and awareness. I mean, it's striking. On one hand, you've got, in your situation, you provide scholarships to families of three and four-year-olds okay. who qualify, um, and I believe, is it $30,000? We, I mean, we are a private organization, so we have no fixed rules, but our typical family is around $35,000 is what they would be earning for a family of So four. of the 20 or 21,000 three- and four-year-olds who benefit from what you do, um, how many more? Uh, let's talk about how many you can't help. Oh, we're reaching a fraction, a fraction. I mean, <laughs> Morris, in Morris County, um, there... There is no, there's, we're not an Abbott school district. So our, the, school, the school systems do not provide the pre-K at all, except in a few, it's, it's growing a little bit, it's, it's coming in, but it's not free. It's a sliding scale they have to pay, uh, and many of the families can't afford to do that. So in Morris County, basically, the situation is if you don't qualify at the, the level of the Head Start type of programs. Well, and, the federal government. Yeah, the determines federal government that. programs. They're, they, and they're, that's a woefully low income level. Um, there, is, there, there are then only certain uh, specific programs that people can go to. Otherwise, there's nothing for them. And we, we have, that's, what, that's our role is to step in and fill that gap, unless and until the, um, the government and the state is willing to step up and, and do something for these families. We, we see that as our role. And we would love to go out of business. Because you would love to go out of business because the need wouldn't <laughs> be there. We, the need, the need not, but not you know what's interesting? Um, we were to sit down with uh, Steve uh, talking about this, and he said something that I want everyone to be able to comment on. I asked him, when we were talking about the fact that the legislature and the state government has not provided the dollars to fund the 2008 initiative to expand this national model, the New Jersey model, uh, this great pre-K program that everyone says, hey, it's really terrific, New Jersey's national model. We should do this in a whole range of other districts outside of the 31, some of the poorest, the Abbott mm -hmm. districts, so the ring around those, the next poorest, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, the response was the money wasn't there. So I said to you in the interview, well, who is the champion in state government? Who is the champion under the gold dome, the capital, um, for the children who are three and four years, for your three and four year olds, and you said there isn't one, and you're shaking your head as I look at you. Is that true, Seal? Yes, we we have certainly talked to legislators on both sides of the aisle about the importance of preschool. There's a lot of support for preschool, but there's no one who stepped up and said this is my top issue and I'm going to make this happen. What happens when there is no? And by the way, what Steve also said in that interview, because your organization, why Rutgers is a state university, the state university, proud to be an alum. It barely got out, but that's another <laughs> story. Um, Rutgers in New Jersey, but your institute doing work across the country. Steve said, in a whole range of states, there are legislators, governors, others who are champions, who champion mm -hmm. early childhood education. That is their issue. But in New Jersey, there is no one who says, this is my issue. 
correct? Did, did I mischaracterize? Yeah, that's exactly right. There are states right now in governor's races, candidates are competing on both sides <laughs> for who has the best preschool expansion proposal. No way. Florida, Texas, Georgia, just three examples. But uh, wait a minute. If New Jersey is the state where they say, you have this wonderful pre-K program, which is a national model, but we have no one who isn't making it an issue, their issue, doesn't that seem, you're making a face on this. No, I'm that just, seems just, not to make sense. That's confusing to me. Why do you think that is, Seal? Because it's true. <laughs> but why, think, it, there's gotta be a reason for well, this. I think is there part no of constituency? The reason, no, I think part of the reason is that we have the high quality preschool that we have that serves 50,000 children because of a Supreme Court decision in New Jersey. Let's make clear what you're saying. The We're Supreme talking about Abbott versus Burke. Okay, so the Supreme Court said that whether you like it or not, state legislature, whether you, whoever the governor is at the time, whether you like it or not, you will provide the dollars through an income tax largely, right, for these 31 school districts and they will get pre-K. Yes. Whether you like it or not. Yes. But then that was only those 31 districts. And then when the legislature said in 2008, what about the next ring of 90 to 100? The court didn't say you had to do that. Therefore, my logic tells me you just said that the Supreme Court, in your opinion, is the only potential champion for three and four year olds. No, I think that's how our program got started. They were the champion. And I think what happened is that the legislature stepped up to support, but not to champion. So when What's the What's the difference? Well, it's a big difference, because you have no one there who's saying, this is my top issue. This is what I'm going to bargain for. This is what I'm going to look for, fight for money for. I'm going to fight for. And I think the timing, as Steve pointed out, when the law passed, we had a year of planning by these districts. It was very exciting. They were very engaged, wanted to do it, and then the recession hit. Um, and we've not, not recovered, and we've not regained ground to step up and say, okay, we're doing a little better as a state. This is the top of our list. Go ahead. Well, we need a champion. Uh, we need someone who will step up from the business community, from the faith community, um, labor, business together, okay. uh, if not from the legislature or the governor's office. Do you see parents stepping up in a grassroots movement saying, these are our kids? Do you see that? I think that will happen. I think when once we make the case, right now people look at pre-K as an economic argument. That's why the ring around is not funded because people look at it and there's a lot of resentment. Once we make Whoa, the resentment case, resentment about what? About the fact that there are 31 districts that have free services and the rest of the districts around the state do not, and that cost is being borne by all of us. But once we take out the economic argument and look at it from a practical standpoint. Their, their academic benefits to pre-K, that's obvious. Their social emotional benefits to pre-K. And as Steve said, if we don't make the investment now, we're gonna spend 10 times as much later. We have to make the case. Politicians follow their constituents. Once the constituents make it an issue, politicians will step up. But it's a question of which constituents because urban constituents, disproportionately the ones in the districts you're talking about, to some extent, but there, New Jersey does have some very poor rural mm -hmm. communities in South Jersey. Yes, the urban districts get the attention, Patterson, Jersey City, Newark, um, but there are low-income districts in South Jersey as well. But, A lot of them are in this next tier of districts. But listen to what was just said, that there's resentment. I, see, I, we had this conversation in the one-on-one -on -one interview that, that, that we did together. I asked you, in Mars County, which is a very diverse county in the sense that it's very wealthy, but it's also uh, very poor, right? Correct. So you help a family, your organization, a, a private, not-for-profit, helps a family send a three or four-year-old to pre-K. So that three and four-year-old now is in a class with a wealthy kid. Correct. And I said, what, what are the, kid, the rich kids like with the kids who aren't so rich? And you said, they're kids, they're fine. So I said, and you also said that's one of the reasons why they, uh, the people who founded your organization, who are wealthy parents, who were able to do that for their kids, one of the reasons they did it, right? Right. What is also being said here is that there's resentment on the part of some in the state who are saying, what, do you, what is the state doing taking some of my money 
and sending it to some of these poorer districts so that those kids can go to pre-K. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I don't see, with, with our funders, um, I don't hear resentment. They, they have just stepped up in their community and said, until someone else does this, we are going to look after but the kids. But your money's all private. Our, but our money is all private. I have heard this from the public school systems in our area sure. who are very frustrated that what they're being asked to do for their kids with no funding and they're being judged on their achievements with no funding while all the money is going elsewhere. That's certainly out there. But you know what I'm also hearing here? That if it's public money, taxpayer money, it's one thing. If it's private money, it's another thing. So if you can do it privately, go for it. If you're going to do it with my tax dollars, it's a totally different story. Correct, Steve? Well, actually, I think the, the politicians and some of the school people uh, are not keeping up with the public. What because do you mean? if you look at polling data, um, the polls are very positive. About pre-K. About pre-K and about what using public dollars. That this is one of the top priorities. Um, sometimes it comes out as the top priority the mm. early years. And that uh, we're not spending enough public money on it. I think where it breaks down and it becomes divisive is where lots of it goes to some districts mm -hmm. and none of it goes to other districts. Right. Got it. Right. As opposed to it's for all our children. Right. Talk about the Apple study. Well, the Apple study. Done by you and your colleagues at Rutgers. Done by our colleagues at Rutgers uh, with the support of foundations and the New Jersey Department of Education. Um, is to look at, so how effective is this preschool program? How sure. effective are all those dollars? we're spending in the Abbott District starting at three? And the answer is um, very effective. Right? So kids, Be specific. Are, kids are doing better when they start kindergarten right off the bat, a lot better. And they're less likely to repeat kindergarten even. They're doing better at second grade and when they hit the standardized test that everybody takes at um, grades four and five, they do better across the board. Language arts, literacy, math and science, and not just a little better, if they've had two years, we're closing a lot of two the years achievement. Two years of pre-K. Two years of pre-K starting at three. They've closed a lot of the achievement gap at fifth grade, most of it. Saving money. Saving money. It's a smart investment, a good investment. You know, Seal knows this because we, we live in the same community. Uh, we have a wonderful pre-K program. It's actually called the Montclair Pre-K, right? Yes. And what fascinates me about it is that it used to have more public funding, mm -hmm. right? If I'm wrong about any of this, no, you're I know you know right. well. It used to have more public funding. And all of our children have gone through it. Our, our daughter uh, right now is going through it. Olivia is going through it right now. And so as it lost some of the public funding, and they wanted, still wanted to have, give every kid an opportunity, even those who couldn't afford it, the opportunity, they had started a sliding scale. But then what they did was, it's now more and more privately funded, right? Mm -hmm. They started to go to parents who they felt had the means and said, look, we want you to sponsor another kid. And sat, a lot of the other kids who can't afford it are going to this pre-K, A, because it's a sliding scale for tuition, and B, because other families are sponsoring them. I think that's great. And I turn around and say, yeah, but it's only because A, the people in that organization went to do that, and B, because the means are in the community. That can't happen in every community. Am I correct? You're correct. And so what happens when that can't happen? I mean, it happens in Montclair because there are people with means and there are people who want to do that. What happens when it can't happen? Because it can't happen in a Newark. Right. I think we get back to the concept of shared responsibility. I think a public-private partnership, so certainly the public sector has to contribute. We should also look at philanthropy, foundations such as mine, to supplement where we can. We have to look at other community resources, the business sector, et cetera. I think we all have to bear responsibility that all of our children deserve a high-quality pre-K experience. Say someone says, that's not my kid. I was thinking about this. Someone says, listen, particularly after 2008, economy's tough, employment situation is rough out there. I'm barely keeping my situation together with my family. You want me to worry about somebody else's kid, you gotta be kidding me. What would you say? It's not just about the kid, it's about the community. This is ultimately a, a community issue. 
um, if these kids start to fail, as Steve talks about, then you, you start to get all these ramifications of the, the, what happens, not only the economic costs, but the cost of the community. You know, if these kids end off being incarcerated, they get in trouble, they end off... I mean, it's your community. It's the community we all live in. Um, and you can't, you can't lock up your doors and say, it's not, not my kids, it's not my problem. It's, I think it's, it's a community responsibility. And whether the money comes privately from the public sector or a combination of, of both, I mean, the, put, getting the pieces together, it's, it's got to be... You've got to deal with it. It can't just be ignored. Yeah. Go back to the, the Newark thing. The, the, you said some seats. There's great demand. And I know in Montclair there's great demand, and, and, and there are not even enough slots at the pre-K for the demand that exists, for the kids who need it. But what's still bothering me, and I'm sure other people watching us on public broadcasting are thinking about it as well, is you said there are slots, seats that are going unfilled. What does that say about the parents who are not doing what needs to be done to put their kid in pre-K? I don't think it says anything about the parents. I think what it speaks to is a lack of awareness. We know a lot well, of parents... Whose job it is, to be, is it to be aware? It, Ultimately, it, it's a parent's responsibility. It's all, of our, it's all of our responsibility. Because, again, if we don't make the investment on the front end, we're all going to bear the cost on the back end. So it's not that parents don't care. It's not that they're not concerned. Sometimes they don't have information. They don't have access to resources. One of the things we're working on at our foundation is putting together a directory and a mobile app that provides parents a list of all resources that are available to them, including how to access pre-K and what to do. Devil's advocate, where is the place, respectfully, where is the place for parental accountability in what you just described? Because what I just heard was you can't in any way blame parents. I, but you have to hold them accountable. And unless I misinterpreted what you just said is they're not accountable. It's not a blame game. I, I think Where's the accountability then? I think we all have accountability. Where's the parents' it's accountability? The, the parents, the community, it's, it's all of us. It's not enough for you know, people in, in suburban or other communities to simply point fing fingers and say what other parents should do. We all have the responsibility. Your thought about that? Well, I agree. I agree with Kim. I think you know, we live and breathe preschool, yep. but families and communities may not. You know, because but it's, their, it's, it's someone's kid. Yes. But if you're not aware that this exists in your community... You mean the opportunity. Yes, right. and it exists for free. You know, we do some community presentations in Newark and some of the other low-income districts, and it's always a surprise to us that people have never heard of Abbott versus Burke. And they that, may not know the court case. And they may not know that preschool is available. It's not a one-shot deal. And for some parents, you know, we do the Newark Kids Count. Right. And we look at data around families in Newark. You have families that are really struggling. Single parent households. We should make it clear that you do a, every year you do a, you and your organization do a wonderful job assessing the condition of kids as it, be, as it relates to a several key factors. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yes, and we do a special one for Newark. You do I statewide you, and Newark. And Newark. Ahead. And you have a lot of families who are under stress. You have a lot of families who are isolated. So those kind of networks, those community and family networks that we take for granted, that are a source of information, may not exist for these families. It is a responsibility of the district, the community, child care programs, Head Start to do that kind of outreach. And also parents need to know how important it is. You know, when, when preschool started in New Jersey, that was a, a bigger issue. Sure. I think m many more people are on board with how important preschool is, but there are still some parents who need to know why this is important and for And you're kids. convinced if they knew, they would take advantage? I believe so. I, I think... All of us, all parents, want what's best for their children. And if there is a resource out there that's proven that is going to ensure that their kids are going to start on a level playing field and be able to succeed, yes, I believe all parents would Especially take advantage if, of it. if it's free. Absolutely. Especially. And in a couple of minutes we have left. With the legislature not stepping up, well, put it this way, with the money not being in place, with the number of kids who still are not getting access to quality pre-K, what are the reasons to continue to be hopeful and positive here? Well, from, from where I sit, it's, it's very much when you tell the story, people get it. It's a simple story. Yep. It's a very simple story. 
it just needs to get told and we need to get it to the right people. The story's there, the data's there, Steve's work's wonderful, it's all that's out there. That's a no-brainer. It, it's absolutely, and that's why we can function as a totally private organization. We go out and tell the story and, and people fund us. Uh, so I think that's why we should be optimistic. I think that it's, there's still a lot of work to be done. And I want to, this thing about- A few the, seconds, go ahead. Yeah, the families. Many of them come from communities and from cultures That's that right. they've never heard and of language is an issue. It, it right. doesn't right. it's not even on their agenda. Right. So they there is a real educational thing for them to understand why that is so important for them. And we kids. can't make certain assumptions that because that's the way we think, everyone thinks that Correct. way. So listen, I cannot thank all of you enough for joining us and talking about um, listen, we can say that our kids are our most precious resource because it sounds good but all of you live it every single day and our kids are better off for it. So I wanna thank you all for being with us. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence and 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the PNC Foundation, the New Jersey Education Association, Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, MD Advantage, Choose New Jersey, Cone Resnick, and by Adler Aphasia Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Governor Tom Kane. A dear friend of mine had aphasia which is a language disorder that occurs from a brain injury or a stroke. It robs a person's ability to communicate, but it doesn't affect their intellect. Programs and services offered at the Adler Aphasia Center help to improve my friend's communication skills, as well as her self-confidence and quality of life. Most importantly, she was among people who understood her. If you or a loved one has been diagnosed with aphasia, there is hope.